Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Sam Cobbs, Executive Director of First Place for Youth. Prior to joining First Place, Sam Cobbs was the Associate Director of Juma Ventures, Director of Program Services for Larkin Street Youth Services, and a Branch Manager for the Boys and Girls Club. Through a series of innovative programs and supportive housing arrangements, First Place helps youth that are aging out of the foster care system to make the transition to independent living. Sam has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Sam, for taking the time to join us today. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about the challenges facing youth that are aging out of the foster care system, and, and uh, then perhaps we can chat a little bit about how First Place meets those challenges and helps youth meet those challenges. Okay. Yes. Uh, young people who are transitioning out of the foster care system are facing some tremendous challenges as they leave the system. As you know, uh, in the state of California, young people are removed from, from their families, uh, oftentimes for very good reasons, for abuse, for neglect, uh, for abandonment. At the age of 18, uh, the state of California says our parentship ends for these young people. So the light switch switches off? The light switch switches off. I've heard stories and actually seen where young people go to sleep on their the night before their 18th birthday to wake up the next morning and their bags are packed because they have to leave this living situation. And that's where First Place steps in at. Young people who are transitioning out of the foster care system, 65% of them face intimate homelessness uh, within the first year of transitioning. Uh, about 20% of young people who transition out of foster care uh, end up incarcerated at some point in their life. 70% of inmates in San Quentin prison report sometime in the, in the child welfare in the foster care system. And so our goal is to change these stats for young people, whereas only 1% of young people who've been in the foster care system in the United States ever graduate college. And so our job and our mission is to begin to change these stats for these young people so that they have a far better second part of their life than their first 18 has been to them. So a life experience that actually is, is putting you on a path of being systematically disadvantaged. It wrenches one's heart to think that one's 18th birthday, which should be a joyous uh, transition into adulthood, uh, becomes a, a, a matter for uh, tremendous anxiety. You're exactly right. Oftentimes we call foster care the foster care system. And if you understand system, system is, means that something goes in, something consistently happens. You're handled as a, uh, as a, as, as a, as a thing. thing. And on the other end, something comes out. And so consistently, the foster care system has brought in young people, and it was meant to be a part-time until families, until relatives were able to be found so that young people could go back home. But what we have, especially in the state of California, is young people who are growing up in the foster care system and therefore they're coming out very disadvantaged. They're, as you said, they're most likely to enter into the penal system. Uh, less than 50% of them actually graduate high school on time, if at any point. And as I said, less than 3% of them actually ever enroll in college with only 1% of that three ever completing. In a dollars and cents sense, society is going to be paying for this fact one way or the other. There's, there's no way to get beyond that. It is going to affect every single person's life if we do not take care of our own. Definitely, if there isn't an appropriate intervention, and if something doesn't happen to help these young people make a transition to a successful adulthood, we're going to pay those things versus what we've seen at first place. They become not takers from our society, but actually givers to our society to bring down our, our tax burden ourselves. And so it's a, it's a contributing factor versus just a reducing the risky behavior piece. So you've got a cost avoidance benefit and you have a revenue benefit financially driven what's in it for me analysis would lead you to to a conclusion to take some sort of step to ameliorate this situation so what kind of of an approach does first place take first place takes a uh, a really innovative approach and it's something that we've been doing uh, for the last 12 years and the first thing that young people need as they're transitioning out they need a place to live 
These young people, as I said, oftentimes become homeless, about 65% of them do. And without that permanent address, without that place to live, you, you cannot begin to go to school. You cannot maintain school. You cannot get a good paying job. And so the first thing that we do is provide housing for these young people. But we do housing in a very innovative way as well. So it is definitely not a handout, but it's more so a hand up. So if I'm, if I'm transitioning out, you're not just saying, um, come, we'll pay your rent. No, definitely we're not just saying, come and we'll pay your rent. Young people have to first work to get into this housing. They have to go to classes prior to help them understand the economics of being in an apartment. We call it a financial literacy, step it up. Once they're in this apartment, young people start off by paying 10% of what the actual rent is. So for an average apartment in the Bay Area that we rent, it's about $750. So for the first three months, young people pay $75 toward their rent. Every three months, the amount that they pay goes up. The amount that first place subsidizes comes down to at the end of the two year subsidy period, the apartment is theirs. They're paying the full market rate rent of this actual apartment. We're paying nothing. And they've lived there for two years now at that point. Not only have they lived there for two years, but something that is very particular about our model is young people are allowed to stay there. That they, for the first time, have the option and the choice of do I live here or do I move? And this is really the first time young people in foster care move on average of nine and a half times. We use a scattered site housing model where we're actually, if you're a landlord and you have a building that has 15 units, we'll come and say, can we rent two of those units? Because we want young people to be in their community, to be a part of their community. We don't want them to be sectioned off and uh, into essentially a dorm situation because a dorm is in real life. I remember the dorms. And you're also not creating a project type housing approach where you concentrate people who have a certain series of challenges into some small ghettoized neighborhood that separates them, creates all that, those issues of, of uh, identification, uh, self-worth. Um, you're basically respecting somebody as a member of society from the, from the very beginning, and that, that whole idea, that integrative idea of this is the real world. Definitely. And so what we want to do is we want to reconnect them. We want to reconnect them to society so that that stigma of foster care or being uh, an underprivileged person isn't there, that they can do the same things that their neighbors do and they live within that community and they thrive within that community as well. So you're actually, your main goal is to make the program have zero future impact in their lives. Exactly. So, so you're tr actually trying to put yourself out of business with that individual for, f from the beginning? Definitely, we're trying to make sure that as young people are in our program, that they're driving and that they're working towards self-sufficiency, that they no longer need us financially, that they no longer need public systems financially, that they are essentially dependent upon themselves for their living. The way that we do that is once they move in, we are really working with them around employment and education. We, we know that young people, if they're going to pay rent, if they're going to sustain this living situation, then they have to have employment. But we also know that upward mobility in our country is determined by education. Yes. That we don't, I don't care who's president, who's in charge, is still going to be determined by education in how, what marketable skills you have for our workplace. And the second thing that we're doing is really making sure that young people are continuing to pursue their education. Our goals are if young people come in and they don't have a high school diploma, that they get one while they're with us. We have just advanced our metrics to say enrolling in post-secondary education is not enough. By the time young people finish us, we want young people to have finished at least two semesters, at least two years, I'm sorry, of post-secondary education. We know from, and this is from old census data before we just did this census, is that young people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, that they must have at least two years of post-secondary education or some intensive job training that gives them certification to move above the poverty level. We know that this is a fact. This is not first place's data, this is US Census data. 
And so in order to help our young people become self-sufficient, this is a main driving point for us to make sure that young people are going to school, that they're matriculating in classes, and that they're getting the training to make themselves marketable so that they can stay self-sufficient after they leave our program. So you have somebody coming in, they're integrated into society, they're, they're taking part of the financial burden, um, but are, are being supported in terms of uh, uh, giving them a bit of a, a runway, but then you set expectations. Amongst those expectations are uh, income, finding a job, and holding a job, um, education. Uh, what other kinds of skills are you, are you trying to help these, these youth uh, acquire? It's not really helping them acquire, but realize that they are resilient. That if you've been through the foster care system and you come out on the other end, you are a very resilient person. So it's about power. It's about power. And it's about taking control of their own destiny. It is about, here's an opportunity. And what we're giving you is an opportunity. And it is up to you to utilize this opportunity. And so we're trying to help them understand what opportunities are. We're trying to help them make good decisions, mm -hmm. to begin to think down this decision tree of, if I do this, then here's the consequence of that. And so we're trying to work with young people so that they begin to understand that they are resilient, that we're re-empowering them because the foster care system definitely depowers them and that they're finding their own voice. And when they find that voice, they are just tremendous people in our, in our society and they go on to do really great things. Powerful individuals can help transform other people's lives, their own and other people's lives. Powerful individuals can pay taxes. Powerful individuals are self-sufficient and on a sustained basis. And, and is that what you're creating? That is definitely what we're creating. And one of my, one of my greatest joys is I've been working at First Place for, in the leader of First Place now for almost five years. I've, uh, prior to that, uh, you mentioned my experience at Larkin Street and at the Boys and Girls Club. What I see is that young people who are able to become powerful individuals could contribute back to their community, therefore bringing up the whole community with them. And so that is the theory around the community development process, the community change process that I believe needs to happen, that I don't think about First Place as a social service organization, I think about it as a social change organization, that the more we empower our young people, they don't leave their communities, they stay in their communities and they begin to pull others up. It is so rewarding to me when I go places and I am doing a speech there, I'm seeing someone there and I see one of our young people who've transitioned out of the program and they're there volunteering. So are, are, are you creating the community entrepreneurs, the community leading citizens? Yes, we are. First, they're going back and attempting to change the foster care system. That's the first thing that they're doing. Oh, really? Second, they are bringing in and bringing up the community around them. They are volunteering in their community. They're working with those who are less fortunate than them. You know, one of the things that we do at First Place is we call it a, a community give back. That every young person in the program has to do something volunteer oriented at least once a quarter. And we want young people to, for sometimes for the first time, to be on the giving end of something versus the receiving end of something. And that is a powerful dynamic change that we see happen within young people to, to develop that stewardship, uh, that community activism that needs to happen in our underserved communities. And so they, they take that power and they continue to utilize that. They get that, they get that good feeling and they continue to chase that good feeling and, and they want to change the dynamics that put them in the situation that they were in in the first place. And that's empowering, the ability to help somebody else. In terms of this model, in a sense, first place as a community starts to exercise the, t the same type of, of conscientiousness that a parent would. A parent has no desire to create codependence. Sometimes success means a little bit of push, um, a little bit of a helping hand, um, but toward uh, an idea of, of a, a child becoming an adult and that adult making a contribution that is useful. What kind of relationship is fostered after 12 years with the youth that have gone through this, this program? Um, and is there a, a, a 
continued connection that, uh, as one would have in a, in a family. I will simply say, we're trying to do for these young people what our parents did for us. That uh, our parents had expectations for us. They had goals for us. They Sometimes had tough expectations. Very tough expectations. They, had, they gave us tough love. They, we couldn't go to them and say that, no, this is something that I can't do. That wasn't necessarily accepted. No, you can do it. And these are the same relationships that we have with our, with our young people. But the key word in that is relationship. That we're developing strong, intense relationships with young people. I saw a quote once that says, rules without relationships equal rebellion. And, and so young people do what it is that you advise them to do, not because you are the authority figure, but because they have a relationship with you and they trust you. And oftentimes, Mark, it is not as formal as that, you know, and, and the way I judge that connectivity sometimes is by the number of invitations I get to graduations, by the number of uh, invites that I get to baby showers by the number of invites that I get to weddings. And these are things that young people want to share and that people want to share to the people, with the people who are important in their lives. And so we're definitely developing that connectivity. Young people are staying involved with us. Uh, they're coming back to give us their, their perspective on how we can do better. And they're also doing tremendous things in their community. And so we are definitely trying to build this this community, this army of, of young people that will begin to change our society. Now, when you came in, you actually came in to take over from a founder team, yes. um, and, and that was an interesting transition. Could you talk a little bit about what you found coming into First Place? The potential of First Place uh, had barely been tapped. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when I came in, the organization essentially had about 17 staff people. Right. Uh, the, the budget was about $1.2 million. What was happening is that the organization was a good organization, but in order for it to survive and grow, some things needed to, some things needed to change. One of, the, one of the things that I was sure of before I stepped in was that I had the full support of the founders team that that was very critical. The, the, the both founders, one who had decided to transition to do something else, and one who was still employed with the organization and is still employed with the organization to, there today, I had their full support. The next thing I knew is I had the full support of the board. I could still honor the past, that they had done good work, but for us to get to greatness, that there were some things that needed to change. So cutting to the chase, you start off, the budget was 1.2, yes. what is the uh, budget today? The budget today is about 9.2. So in the last five years, you've grown rather dramatically. Yes, we have grown rather dramatically. Five years ago, almost five years ago, we were serving, essentially we had the capacity to serve about 40 young people in our core housing program. Uh, last night, about 220 young people and with an addition of 134 of their kids we're in our housing program, primarily in the Oakland uh, area. Now we have uh, programs in four Bay Area counties, San Francisco, Alameda, Contra Costa, Solano, and we've just opened up our first office in Los Angeles. These are the communities that in the state of California are most impacted by young people transitioning out of foster care. Uh, Los Angeles County, for instance, has half of California's foster care youth reside in Los Angeles County. That is essentially equal to the top three states, mm -hmm. uh, Illinois, Texas, and Florida. And so Los Angeles County in itself is a state. And so that county is tremendously impacted by not having appropriate interventions and appropriate services for young people as they transition out of foster care. You also have a pipeline to, to, to the prison system. Uh, you're, you basically have, have created the beginning of your funnel that results in prison populations and the costs of prison populations. Exactly. As I, as I mentioned earlier, there's a study done in a survey of San Quentin inmates, and 70% of them reported that they had been in the foster care system. Not a that, coincidence. Not a, not a coincidence. And those are the things that we are trying 
to change. And we've had tremendous success in doing that. And we, one of the things that we did and started to do five years ago was to begin to set metrics and measure our success uh, so that we could understand what it was that we were doing well and what it was that we weren't doing so well. And we began to set expectations for ourselves and to say that if we don't hit this, that that is not a success. Three out of four is not a success. Four out of four is a success. And that is what we continually thrive for. Consistent pursuit of excellence is one of our, our core principles at first place. And that is what we do every day. One of the things that I find interesting is that despite the fact that you have a very dramatic journey with a lot of change from $1.2 million to $9 million in terms of budget, the, the scope of your programs and so on, is that the first thing you do when you start thinking about change and dramatic change is you do something that is, that is quite mundane. You start off with metrics. Metrics doesn't create a changed job. Uh, metrics doesn't, doesn't fire anybody or hire new people or create a different organization structure. Metrics actually starts to unfold data, information. It becomes a communication mechanism. Why was metrics so important to enabling that, that next phase of your journey? And why did you start there rather than doing a strategic review or, or bringing in a consultant or the, the reason I started with the metrics were, was because of the foundation that had been laid prior to me getting there. Uh, first place was always about uh, impact. What I did was I went in and began to formalize what that actually looked like. Let's say what that impact is. Let's articulate what that impact is. And then let's go back and measure it to see if we're actually doing it. And the process actually get, brought the board and the staff together and engaged them in the thinking process of what that transformation was like for the young people. And the young people also participated in, in that. Yeah, the young people definitely participated in it. And the, the board and the staff uh, were definitely all on board with it. But I, I must say that saying you want to do metrics developing the metrics in the measurements, everybody being on board with it. That's one thing. The trouble came. <laughs> the fun part came after you developed them and it is like, okay, now call, let's, now that let's that go to hit them. The trouble, the, the trouble came and then you changed that to yeah, the fun, the fun part. Yes, the, the fun, fun part, part came because there were, there were things after you develop your metrics and you say, here are the things that you want to accomplish. Here's the impact that you want to have on behalf of young people. Sometimes there are things that you have done that you no longer do because it's not having that impact that you thought it was having. Right. And so that's when, the, that's when the fun began to happen. Um, and for the last two years, it's inserting that culture. And one of the things that I will, you know, you mentioned kind of lessons learned. One of the things that I've learned is that metrics by themselves don't do it, that you can come up with these metrics but it really is a culture shift and a culture change to become an outcome-driven organization. You can say that, you can have them on the wall, but if you're gonna truly begin to hit those things, accountability sometimes in social services and nonprofit organizations is talked about but often never, uh, never realized. And so, so results having that orientation. It results orientation from everything from we have a business plan. Our business plan informs our yearly, what we call game plan or operational plan. That goes into people's individual work plans. And the way we give increases in salary and all of those things is depending on how you did on your work plan. How did you do with these metrics? Evidence-based. Evidence Evidence-based. And the numbers all go back to what is the impact that we're making with young people. Those numbers aren't just numbers, those numbers are young people. It's how many young people are getting their high school diploma? How many of them are going to college? How many of them are working at jobs uh, that are above the poverty level and making enough income that they can actually take care of themselves? So you, you create the consensus around the fact that the organization will, will be focused on results, which actually is embedded in the culture before you came. Um, you then, um, heighten that sensitivity and you focus on evidence 
and you gain a, a consensus on, on what type of evidence is important uh, to measuring results. And now you have a mechanism, you have a, a lever for transforming the organization, for taking strategic decisions uh, moving forward, that while there might be winners and losers, and the losers internally to the organization might be less happy and the winners might be more happy, at least you have a basis on which uh, th th that will guide your actions. That was a big factor in the, in the speed of the, of the transformation. Um, one, one point to that as well is that what we've also been able to do because of this data and this metrics is determine what works and what doesn't work. There are certain interventions that may work with this part of our population but doesn't necessarily work with this part. And so therefore we can train our staff on here are the things that are effective uh, when you're running into this issue. Here are the partners out there that we work with who are effective in working with this type of young person. First Place has always been an organization as well that essentially had two lines of business. One was it was a really great direct service, one young person at a time, uh, helping young people to transition. The other thing that it did, and this was from its base, from its core, and this was the piece that I had to learn the most about when I got there, was systems change and advocacy work. Let's change the system that produces this result on the other end. And one of the things that we did over the last four years is begin to advocate to state government, begin to advocate to the federal government that there are some changes in the foster care system. There are some changes in the supports that need to happen for these young people. And we were able to use that data to show them if you make these changes, then here's what you're going to get versus what you've been getting all, all of this time. Here's your return on investment. And some policies changed, some legislation was passed, and that, those policy changes and, those le and that legislation is essentially the, the economic capital that fueled the transition, but we wouldn't have been able to do it without those metrics. You're basically saying, look, if we want to be out of business, we want to put ourselves out of business, we want you to put us out of business, so stop creating the problem in the first place. You know, you use those words, putting yourself out of business. I did a, um, a presentation for the, uh, for the mayors of, of major cities and was invited by um, Mayor Newsom to do that. And one of the things that I said is we were trying to get them to endorse some federal legislation was I said, you have the opportunity to put me out of business. And the opportunity to put me out of business is to enact legislation that, that doesn't produce the problems that we're having. And that, from our advocacy work, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to put ourselves out of business. We're trying to uh, convince legislators to make changes that don't have these negative consequences on, on young people. So and what kind of changes would you, would you want to see happen in the foster care? There's data out there that says a young person who grows up doesn't have to be the mother or father, but with a biological relative is destined to do much better than a young person who's in the foster care system. Knowing their identity, get, knowing, having that, con that connection. Knowing that identity, having that connection, it essentially costs taxpayers $60,000 annually for every young person that's in foster care. If you place young people back with their families and maybe contributed five to $10,000 a year to close a financial gap that the family may have, that's a tremendous cost savings and it benefits the young person in a better way. They do better. The stats have shown that they do better. That is one tremendous change that we would like to see is that there's a greater focus on young people going back into their communities. Of the foster care population where this is possible, you're talking about a net benefit to society, to the taxpayer, of forty to fifty thousand dollars per foster care child. Yes, that's economic stimulus there. Uh, that's <laughs> that. You know, that is that is savings. One of the other, there will still be young people who may not have that family to go to, may not have that uh, uh, that extended kin. For those young people, 
we need to lengthen the, uh, the runway for them. You know, one of the pieces of legislation that we've gotten passed is that uh, young people can potentially opt in to stand into foster care until the age of 21 so that they're not necessarily just put out before they're ready. But in order to stay in, they have to be involved in programs like First Place. They have to be involved in programs that they're focusing on work, not only just focus on work, but they're actually working. Or they have to be going to school. Now won't that increase costs? Because, I mean, theoretically, 18, you flip off the switch, if you, if you increase it to 21, that's another three years. And at a certain point, the switch does have to be flipped off, doesn't it? We have to come up with cost-neutral ideas or either cost savings ideas. So that's, this is the cost savings over here. Let's get young people back into their families. Right. Let's provide that support. We can save taxpayers about $55,000 a year. Then let's also extend the runway for these young people who can't do that. There was a uh, interesting article that I read the other day and went back to the research around uh, at the Pew Institute. And it talked about, it did a study of, uh, I guess, the millennials, the 18 to 29 year olds, and how they're faring in this economic climate that we're actually having right now. And one of the things that it quoted in there is that 50% of people between the ages of 18 to 29 are actually still living with their parents. 50%, over 70% say that they're getting some type of financial assistance so I from wonder, their parents. So I wonder if we took kids who have parents mm -hmm. and we basically forced them to have the same kind of experience a fostered young person has when they, when they turn 18. We basically say, 18, you're out on the street. I wonder how many of those kids would end up having a similar experience to the foster youth that are having that experience. Uh, perhaps, no matter how good a foundation it is, if, if the experience is basically you're on your own, flipped like a light, light switch, um, that in and of itself creates part of the problem. That would be a very interesting modern day trading places. Uh, but you know, the one thing that the, the financial support and the emotional support that our young people don't have um, after they transition is tremendous. But there is something else that young people who are involved in families have that our young people also don't have. And that is that mentor, that family member that they see getting up, going to work every day, that they see doing the right thing. And so I don't think it would actually equal out because that, that mentoring, that understanding what is right and wrong, what it, that, that ethics that come with growing up, in a, growing up in a family, those expectations. No one has ever had expectations for these young people before. You don't have to go to school if you don't want to go to school. Right. Those things are, are things that we are just now instilling in our young people. You know, um, the majority of our young people come from group homes or residential settings. They have literally, Mark, never seen anyone get up and go to work. Everyone that they've seen work has come to them to do their work. And so that is, a, that is a tremendous difference as well. Your advocacy is having the, the effect of urging uh, state government and municipalities to think about the obligations of their populations receiving services. Government has to be more demanding. If we want to begin, if we really want to truly realize these, um, these, these financial gains as well as the social gains, then it has to be more demanding. We have changed the notion of the organization and changed you as a contributor to us from you giving to a charity as you investing in our program. And if you are an investor, you want a return on your investment. And the only way to have a good return on your investment is that you have to create these obligations, that these are the things that this program needs to be able to accomplish to continue to get your investment. If that is not the case, uh, then we will continue to do the same thing we have always have done and get the same result. Opportunity and making sure that young people are taking advantage of this opportunity is the only thing that we can, that they can ask for, and it's really the only thing that they want. So are you transforming um, social service programs into, into a social enterprise? 
Are you transforming government programs into a social enterprise? What's happening now, Mark, especially in the economic situation that we're in, just like with government, just like with philanthropy, they're looking at their dollars in the same way that we look at ours. That when times are tough, and if we're gonna invest in something, we're gonna invest in something that we think is gonna draw a return. If we got a lot of money, then maybe we take a, a chance on something that's risky. But we need to invest in something that's going to gain a return. And so that is what is happening in our society. And for the nonprofits who are not willing to measure, and create these metrics, not willing to show their impact, not willing to put these obligations on the people that they serve and continue to say that these people can't do that, they're gonna have a very tough time surviving the next decade because this is where the field is, is moving, this is, where things are, this is where things are going, and all of the indications that I see coming out of Washington, coming out of the federal government, is this is the way that the government is going to begin to invest this money. That it's going to continue to have social programs, but it's gonna want tremendous social return uh, for that investment around social programs. A great program. This model has a, a lot of hope built into it, and I'd like to thank you for sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Thank you again for having me.